This is a B7 Audi RS4 and it's actually pretty special to have one back on the channel because it was one of these cars that I made my first slightly awkward YouTube debut with. It's not only that, but it's the way the power's delivered. It's done in such a characterful way. But that was then, this is now. If you're in the market for one of these cars, you've clicked on the right video because I'm gonna take you through all the common problems, show you everything that tends to go wrong. Let's go. So engine then, what have we got? Well, 4.2 litre V8, very, very similar to what you're gonna find in the early R8 V8s. And as a result of that, a very similar problem sheet as to what you're gonna find with those cars as well. Number one being carbon buildup. This is where we get lots of little carbon deposits sticking and adhering to the inlet side of the internals of the engine. So your valves and stuff tend to get a bit choked up. Now, Audi did make this better on the very last V8s that went into the R8s, but unfortunately, these early engines, they really do suffer from it. Now, thankfully, there are a number of specialists out there that will dismantle this and clean things properly for you, also known as a carbon clean. However, expect to pay somewhere in the region of £1,200 to £1,400 for that. It's quite a big labour-intensive job. And in terms of the chemical cleaners, just avoid it. Just due to the nature of this carbon buildup, the chemical cleaners aren't gonna to touch it. So part of that inlet assembly are little flaps. Now the idea behind these is they'll close over beneath 3000 RPM to favor economy. <laughs> yeah, favor economy on the 4.2 liter V8. And then above 3000 RPM, they open up to favor performance. Now the problem is they get choked up with carbon as well so they can tend to stick. That will usually put a light on on the dash so you'll spot that if it's the case and it will tend to limit the RPM to about 5,000 as well. Now the other problem with those flaps are they're each held in place with two little screws. Now they're well known for coming undone, dropping into the engine and causing horrendous damage throughout. So honestly, if you're looking at a car and it says in the ad it's been deflapped, that's what it's referring to and I would say that's probably a bonus. Bear in mind that that should probably be accompanied by a remap, but it isn't always. There's a way in which you can remove the flaps, leave certain components in place, and kind of fill the computer into thinking they're still there. Cars that have been done that way tend to have a bit of a rougher cold start, but it's not the end of the world. Ideally though, it's gonna have been remapped when those flaps were removed. So one component pretty well known for going bad in these engines is the positive crankcase ventilation valve or PCV valve for short. Now this can lead to quite high oil consumption, it can lead to blown blue smoke, but what does it actually do? Well, let's explain. So inside our engine, we all know, probably, that the piston goes up, it compresses the air and fuel mixture, goes bang, and that's how we get our power. But what a lot of people don't consider is what about all the air that's now filled the inside of that cylinder? What happens when it goes back down? Well, that's the PCV's job, is to remove as much of this air as possible to decrease the resistance. But what happens when we get a leaky or failing PCV? Well, we could end up with the opposite, and this ends up in positive pressure. And that is gonna do things like increase our oil consumption. So next up, as these cars age, common problem, the injectors are starting to fail. Now there's not too much to say on this fault, but thankfully for you, if you look at a car with a failing injector, it's probably gonna be running like a bag of bolts. So gonna be easy spotted. Next up, along the front here, we've got a fair bit of cooling going on. Now what's quite interesting for an RS Audi of this era is it was actually sold over in America as well. So they fitted a bit more cooling onto these cars from what they would have had if it was just European only. So each side, we've got auxiliary radiators, and then in the center, we've got the oil cooler. Now, unfortunately, this is all quite common to corrode and leak. Good thing though, is if you get a torch in here, have a look on the under trays, you should be able to spot any oily residue as it starts to come out. Bring that into the negotiation, save yourself a bit of money. So next up, let's talk about probably the most publicized problem that you'll find on these cars, and that is to do with the suspension. The DRC, or Dynamic Ride Control Suspension. The way that this system works is it diagonally links each strut, so as you pitch into a corner, it can prop up that side of the car, eliminate body roll. It's a really impressive system, and if you drive one of these cars with it working, chances are you will be impressed. 
problem is, however, it's not very reliable. And you've got two failure points. You've got the struts themselves that tend to leak, and you've also got the lines that link them. On the R8s of similar generation, you get the problems with the mag ride. At least on those, you only need to swap out the strut. On these, you also have the lines to worry about as well, and they're not cheap to get refurbished, unfortunately. So what you're looking for is any oily residue on the bottom of those struts, and if it's bad enough, it'll also clunk over bumps. So listen out for that on the test drive. Another problem to be on the lookout for is with the headlights. Now it's not that these don't work, so this fault could be easily missed. It's to do with the self-leveling motors inside the headlight. When they start to fail, they don't stay steady. So if you look at the light beam and it's jumping around, that needs replacing. It is an older car, so corrosion is starting to become pretty commonplace on these. Watch out it's not on the car that you're looking at because chances are you'll end up painting half the car to get a decent match. So these front aluminium wings, watch for any oxidization on them. Moving towards the rear, rear quarters are really common. You tend to get a bit of bubbling on these. Boot lids as well, check all these points. And also, these aluminium fixing plates for the mirrors, these tend to go all white and powdery. And again, it's just common corrosion. These aren't cheap though, and they are quite hard to dismantle four or five hundred pounds per set. Next up, it might be unlikely that the car you're looking at has still got the standard exhaust on it, but if it does, exhaust flaps are really common for gumming up and jamming. Also, some of these Miltech systems, if it's one with the valves fitted, be aware of that as well. Now on the interior, let's hop in. There's not too much to talk about here. Typical Audi, really. Everything tends to be pretty good quality. The one thing I will say is that there's a few options that if I was buying one of these cars again, I would definitely want. So let's get into them. First up, these amazing bolstered wing back seats. These are the ones as well that when you hit the little S button on the steering wheel, the bolsters can puff up and hold you in place. Bit of a gimmick, but a nice thing to have. Now in terms of the other options that I personally would have to have in my RS4, flat bottom wheel i just think these look so special it does so much to boost this interior and also it's very closely related to the lamborghini gallardo steering wheel of the same era i mean that's pretty cool in itself and also these inlays now you could get these in a variety of different styles carbon was by far the most desirable however so i would want to have that as well now on the gearbox front, couple things to mention here. Obviously, we're predating the days of super advanced, sophisticated dual clutches here, and we've got the good old six-speed manual. Now this is a robust gearbox, don't get me wrong. There is one Achilles heel with it, however, and that was the first and second gear synchros. So whatever you do on that test drive, make sure it's not grinding going into either of those gears or it's gonna be a transmission out job, which is not gonna be light on the wallet. The other thing as well is there was a revised shift collar. So if the car that you're buying has ever had the gearbox out and those parts replaced, it's probably had that revised shift collar put in. If not, it would be put in in future if you ever had any problems. Now carrying on from that, not strictly the gearbox, but the clutch, there was a problem with some of the clutches on certain cars. It was to do with the master cylinder, when it would start to go bad, you'd end up with a sticky clutch pedal. Usually you notice this under hard acceleration, by the way. So again, on that test drive, make sure you get your foot into that accelerator pedal, get through the gears a little bit. And what you're looking for is make sure that clutch comes up nice and cleanly. It's not sticking halfway or anything like that, or that might suggest that there's a new master cylinder needed. And there you have it. You now have all the tips you need to go off and find yourself a brilliant B7 RS4. But hang around and see how it scores on a reliability leaderboard. So how do we score it then? Well, it's inevitable as these cars get older, as every car does, the reliability tends to drop a little bit. So when these were a had younger we might have said maybe an 8 out of 10 but given that some age related problems are starting to seep in there if you're looking at using one of these realistically driving it day to day we award it a 7.5 out of 10. Now thank you so much for watching if you want a laugh I'll put a link to my very first YouTube review video using an RS4 B7 at that go off and have a look don't slag me off though it was the early days right but thank you so much for watching. Please do hit the subscribe button. I'll see you next time.